Keeping his uh, call to order, uh, we uh, are grateful that we have a fine panel of witnesses. I would ask the witnesses, uh, if they could, to provide five minutes worth of oral testimony. Anything you want to put in the record will be put into the record, but five minutes and that will give our panel, uh, our, our committee members here, a chance to uh, go get into a dialogue about the points that you've made in your five minute remarks. So first is, uh, uh, I will introduce all of them and then we'll start with Mr. Bardos. After that, Gordon Bardos is president of the Southeast European Research and Consulting. It is a political risk analysis firm specializing in Southeastern Europe. He previously served as director for the Association for the Study of Nationalities and as a linguist for NATO-led stabilization forces in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, Joseph Di Guardia, Di Guardi, no, I should know that after all, all our years. I've been mispronouncing it every time I see him for the last 30 years. A former member of Congress, a member of this committee, and while in office uh, and later as a prominent Albanian American leader, he has worked tirelessly to uh, f focus the attention of the American government on the Balkans. He is responsible for helping bring about the first congressional hearing on Kosovo in 1987. Today is president of the Albanian American Civic League. And finally, Mr. Daniel Serber, uh, who is an academic director uh, of conflict management at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He's also a scholar in the Middle East Institute. Previously, he was a minister counselor at the Department of State, serving as U.S. Special Envoy and Coordinator for the Bosnian Federation. So we have some people who have got experience on the ground and a great deal of knowledge to share, and uh, we appreciate you joining us. Mr. Bar Dr. Bardos, uh, you may proceed. Now? Better? Okay. The current crisis of Balkan democracies, the dangers inherent in opening a Balkan front in the new Cold War, the need to improve the economies of the Balkan states, and the challenge of confronting Islamist terrorist groups in southeastern Europe. Just in the two weeks since this hearing was scheduled, two Balkan governments have essentially fallen. And overall, as one European diplomat has noted, two states in the Western Balkans are on the verge of disintegration and three are in deep political crisis. International democracy monitoring organizations, such as Freedom House and the Economist Intelligence Unit's Democracy Index, all agree that democratization in the region has either stalled or backslided over the past few, ten, 10 years. Um, I was going to do a glance around the region, but I think Secretary Yi already, already did that, so there's no need for that. I'll concentrate on something else. In the midst of all of these troubles, most people's attention is focused on Rus what Russia is doing in the Balkans. I want to argue that this obsession with Russia in the Balkans is as misguided and potentially as detrimental as the discussion about WMDs in Iraq was. Because turning the Balkans into another front in the new Cold War will sacrifice democracy in the region for yet another generation. By almost any measure, military, diplomatic, and economic, the U.S. and the EU have achieved, a do have achieved dominant positions in Southeastern Europe. To give just two examples, and more provided in my written testimony, every country in Southeastern Europe is currently a member of NATO or a member of the Partnership for Peace program. Russia currently has formalized military alliances with none of the countries in the region. In 2015, Serbia conducted two military exercises with Russia. In the same year, Serbia conducted 22 military exercises with NATO. To sum up my argument, I would use a sports analogy. In the game with the Russians in the Balkans, we are leading by 78 to 13. Some people think we need to keep on running up the score. I would argue that it would be better for us to call this game and start preparing for the challenges posed by next week's opponent. Viewed in this context, the challenge presented by next week's opponent is going to be stabilizing and strengthening the Balkans' failing democratic institutions 
and resuscitating the region's stagnant economies. To put the economic situation in the Balkans in some perspective, the states in the region have gone through an economic depression that has lasted far longer and cut far deeper than anything the United States experienced in the 1920s. In 2015, Serbia's GDP was still 25% what it was below what it was in 1989. According to the World Bank, Bosnia currently has the highest youth unemployment rate in the world. Um, and of course, the Greek debt crisis is still, still far from over. Unfortunately, promoting the Balkans' democratic and economic development will be impossible if the region becomes yet another front in the new Cold War. Finally, we need to address a serious problem in the region that I believe is getting insufficient attention, the growth and spread of Islamist extremist movements. Thanks in part to the work of Saudi, Qatari, Iranian, and other groups, a militant form of Islam has been steadily encroaching on the region's traditionally more mild traditions. Albania, Albania, Bosnia, and Kosovo are estimated to have produced more jihad volunteers per capita than any other countries in Europe. The importance of the Balkans in the international jihadi movement is also evident from the frequency with which a Balkan connection can be made to almost every terrorist incident in Europe. The Balkans also play an important role in the European terrorist threat matrix as a source of armaments. Thanks to the Yugoslav wars of the 1990s, and Albania's near meltdown in 1997-1998, jihadis can obtain practically whatever weapons they might want in southeastern Europe's black market arms bazaars. What should be of particular concern is the de degree to which Balkan militant Islamists can, or have, establish ties with southeastern Europe's flourishing organized crime networks, which are amply skilled in human trafficking and drug and weapon smuggling. Indeed, given the current state of the Balkans, it would not be difficult to put together all of the elements needed to make everyone's nightmare scenario, terrorists acquiring nuclear weapons, come true. At least three times over the past five years, the FBI has helped to thwart efforts to sell nuclear and radioactive material in Moldova. We've been lucky so far, but the combination of weapons-grade uranium on the black market and apocalyptic terror groups with known ambitions to acquire nuclear weapons should be a loud wake-up call to everyone concerned. To deal with all of these problems, we need to make several adjustments to our policy towards the region. First, we need to align our political ambitions and political projects more closely to the region's political culture and political tradition. Far too often over the past 20 years, we have been engaged in political and social experimentation that simply will not work in the Balkan environment. Second, we need to start entertaining the possibility that the stability versus democracy trade-off might be a false dichotomy. A strong argument could be made that leaders and groups that believe they enjoy Washington's favor or believe they know how to manipulate American policymakers will increasingly press their advantages against both domestic and foreign op opponents, resulting in less democracy internally and more aggressive policies externally. Third, we need to spend less of our diplomatic time and energy on micromanaging states and more on, on organizing a coordinated and coherent approach to the region by major powers such as Turkey, Russia, and of course the EU. Whether we care to admit it in the current political atmosphere, each of these actors will be needed in promoting stability and peace in the Balkans over the coming years. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for, for inviting me to share some thoughts with you on the situation in the Balkans, um, with you and the committee. Um, I've discussed all of these matters in more detail in my written testimony, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much. Joe? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we were here two years ago. You had a wonderful hearing, and it was uh, mainly on Kosovo and Macedonia. And you could see the photo all the way to the, uh, it's being blocked by the fellow from Voice of, uh, excuse me, Pacheo, could you move, please? There is Mr. Ziad and Sella with you two years ago, being greeted after the hearing up there, surrounded by his family and friends from where he was the mayor of Struga. He was announcing that he was now going to embark on an impossible task of reforming, politically reforming the state of Macedonia. Two years later, it was Ziadine Sella and his party that was able to meet the qualifications of the mandate. And 
under the Constitution, as bad as that Constitution was, and under European law, naturally, he had to be given by President Ivanov the right to form a government after the ruling party under the strongman, Mr. Gruevsky, was not able to. So you were right in your comments before. He was able to get a coalition of parliamentarians, Slav and Albanian, to be a majority and form the government. When he was supposed to form the government on September 27th, look at the result. There he is in a hospital bed. Uh, right below, you'll see his face bloody. He's being pulled out by a thug. And just to show you how big these Slav thugs were that were hired by Mr. Gruevsky, take a look at this right here, the guy with the beard. He's one of them. That was the beginning of the melee. What happened on the 27th was Gruevsky's attempt to be sure that there would be no reforms, that there would be no new government, because he knows how high his crimes are and he's afraid to be prosecuted and put in jail. So he must keep control. So what you heard today is like we heard from Mr. Milosevic so many times when we were able to get hearings here. The day of the hearing, they released prisoners. They did this, they did that. So just today, because our Civic League has advertised this, has told the world that this hearing was going to be really important for Macedonia. And in this room, I dare say that 90% of the participants are ethnic Albanians from Macedonia whose families are still there suffering. They came from one from Alaska, many for, from Chicago, two from Iowa. They're here because they wanted to show you their concern, just the way the Kosovars did many times when we had those hearings. But look at this. Now, He's being pulled out here. Look at the blood on his face. He was given up for dead. Now, the only reason he's in that hospital bed is that there was a security guard, the only Albanian hired by the Macedonian government to show you the economic discrimination in this country. That Albanian security guard realized that he was not dead. He was still breathing. They walked away from him. He took him and put him in a room, hit him, until the place cleared out. Then he was delivered by an ambulance or an armored car to the hospital. His doctor, Ziedin, couldn't come here. He wanted to be here, but I was naive in thinking he could. He's had so many concussions. If you look at the picture, you're not just seeing dry blood. You're seeing pummeling, constant fists to the face and to the head. They were there to kill him. They advertised this weeks and weeks in advance that this man was an enemy of the state. It reminds me of what Milosevic called me, an enemy of the state. They called him an enemy of the people. This is a signal to Udba or the security forces to eliminate that person. And that's what they tried to do on September the 27th. They went two and a half hours. They put the uniformed police outside. They only came in after two and a half hours when they thought they had beat up everybody and killed Ziadin, only to find out that he was put in the hospital, resuscitated, his doctor, Arbin Taravari. Arbin, stand up just for a minute. It's right here. He flew in. He's a neurosurgeon. He had operations. But for one day, he said, I have to come here and at least take Ziadine's place and, and, and let people know that this man is going to come back and reform the government. So what do you make of today? This is not going to continue. Whatever Ivanov did, it's not going to last. It's too dangerous for Goreski to have a new government. You have to remember, Mr. Chairman, 20,000 audio tapes were made public by the Slav op opposition of Mr. Gorevsky, Mr. Zayev, who, whose party now, uh, I think it's LSDM, is in, in coalition with the party of, uh, party of Ziedin Sela. He, uh, he is not going to allow that coalition to go forward because he knows Everything has been publicized. The only answer to Gruevsky to those wiretaps was, how, where did they come from? Some foreign thing? He won't deny them. And you can't believe what some of these wiretaps say. It also, I mean, what they say are things like those Albanians that we set up in this Matza case. And you know what? They have long jail sentences. They couldn't adequately defend themselves. They were set up. They were not even guilty, but now they're in long prison sentences. You have Comnova, when they set up this uh, uh, phony operation and called it uh, the Albanians from Kosovo coming into military action, they were actually hired 
by Slavs to do that for an excuse to go further in their opposition or their repression of the Albanian people. Where did this all start? You, you said that the country of Yugoslavia disappeared, disintegrated in 1991, 1992. Somehow, the government of Macedonia slipped in with no opposition as an independent state in 1992 with an old type constitution under the former Yugoslavia. And when they formed the state, it clearly says this is a state for Macedonian Slavs. They don't mention Albanians, they don't mention Bulgarians, and by the way, no, there's no majority in this state. One third Bulgarian, one third Albanian, and one third Macedonian Slav. That's the kind of state it is. But the Albanians have practically no rights whatsoever. Five percent or less of the Serbs in northern Kosovo have much greater rights, including language rights, than probably 40 percent of the country, let's say at least 35 percent of the country in, in, in Macedonia. So what, what's here for Albanians? They, we should have had a solution to this. 16 years ago, to stop the violent conflict between the Albanians in Macedonia and the Slavs, we guaranteed with Europe something called the ohir okrit Agreement. 16 years have passed by and things have only gotten worse because Gruevski, like a racketeer the way he is, he co-opted the junior Albanian party that put him into office and nothing's been done. So one of the recommendations I'm going to make to you is that we have to go forward with the State Department, the U.S. taking a more, much more active role in a framework to implement the rights of the Okrit Agreement. We must get that constitution changed so that it codifies the fact that you have at least two major ethnic groups in this state that need equal rights, because there's nothing like equal rights. You talk about the economic discrimination and the political corruption against the Albanian people, it's monstrous. And just economic discrimination. Many jobs are given out in the government. If you have 33 percent, and they were supposed to get up to 25 or 30 percent on the Albanian side, they haven't hit 10. It's around 7 percent. No jobs. The unemployment rate must be just like uh, you know, what's going on in Bosnia right now, the highest in Europe. Joe, you've got, you've, <coughs> of course. May I put on the record, uh, I've just summarized my comments. <coughs> I'd like to put my full testimony uh, on the record in, in writing. I'd like to then put the interview by the person who saved Zidane and Sela, the Albanian security guard. I had it translated from Albanian to English. I want to put in some of the photos you haven't seen, because when he was here two years ago, he also met with Senator McCain, and hopefully that'll be done by the doctor before he goes back. And I want to put on the record this statement that I put on the record in 1991 when Chairman Pell was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and 1998 when Senator Biden was. It's the expulsion of the Albanians by Vazul Trubilovic, 1937. This paper is the modus operandi of the Slavs and the Serbs. They want to get rid of all Albanians. I've quoted it in my testimony. I want to put the entire a document on the record so you can see they're not going to give up on this. And two articles, sir. One, yeah. one from Mr. Foray, one of the... Joe, Joe we got, you, we, without objection, Thank all of that will be put into the record. Okay. Thank you. you. did get twice as much as everybody else. Thank you. Mr. Appreciate Server. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Meeks. With permission, I would like to submit a written statement for the record and use a few minutes for just three key points. First, the countries of the region made remarkable progress in the 10 years or so after the NATO intervention in Bosnia in 1995. But in the last 10 years, these past 10 years, the U.S. effort to pass the baton of leadership to the European Union has allowed slippage. In Bosnia, Kosovo, Serbia, and Macedonia, there are now risks of instability that could trigger a region-wide convulsion. That would reflect badly on America's global leadership role, unravel three peace agreements, and cost us far more than conflict prevention. Second, those who say ethnic partition through rearrangement of borders would be a, vi would be a viable solution are playing with matches near a powder cake. Moves in that direction would lead to violence, including ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, and even genocide. It happened in the 1990s, and it could happen again. Monoethnic states cannot be achieved 
without a massive and expensive peacekeeping deployment. Ethnic partition would not only be violent, it would also generate a new flood of refugees and creation of Islamic mini-states in parts of Bosnia, Kosovo, and Serbia proper. This was a main reason we refused to move borders in the 1990s. Americans should be even more concerned about it today. The Islamic State and Al-Qaeda have had more success recruiting in the Balkans than many of us thought possible given the pro-Western and pro-American attitudes of most Muslims in the region. Reducing Balkan Muslims to rump mono-ethnic states would radicalize many more. Damage would not be limited to the Balkans. Russia would welcome ethnic partition because it would validate Moscow's destructive irredentist behavior in South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Transnistria, Crimea, and Donbass, as well as give Moscow a stronger foothold in the region. It would also leave a geographic gap in NATO and the EU that we have long hoped would be filled with friends and allies. My third point is this. I see no serious alternative in the Balkans to the political and economic reforms required for each of the countries of the region to be eligible for NATO and EU membership. All want to join the EU, which unfortunately will not be able to begin admitting them until 2020 at the earliest. That leaves NATO membership as the vital carrot for reform except in Serbia. We need to do more to enable Balkan countries that want to do so to join the alliance as Montenegro is doing right now. Let me summarize what this really means. In Macedonia, it means Europe and the US need to tell Greece the firearm will be invited to join NATO once it reestablishes transparent and accountable democratic governance. In Kosovo, it means ensuring Pristina develops an army designed for international peacekeeping that poses no threats to Serbs. For that, Serbia will need to accept Kosovo's sovereignty and territorial integrity by allowing UN membership. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, NATO members should tell Republika Serbska secession will gain no Western recognition or aid for it or any country it joins, including from the IMF and the World Bank. These and other suggestions in my written testimony would put the region back on track and prevent the peace agreements of the 1990s and 2001 from unraveling. So too would ensuring that all Balkan countries have access to energy supplies from countries other than Russia natural gas from Azerbaijan, LNG from the US, or eventually Mediterranean gas from Cyprus or Israel. Mr. Chairman, I've just outlined a substantial list of diplomatic tasks. If the administration commits to them, implementation might require an American special envoy. But a policy should come first, one based on maintaining current borders, preventing ethnic partition, and pushing hard for NATO and EU membership. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.